T.R. Shaw. I am a board member here at the museum. I'm also uh, retired from the Navy and involved in several of the uh, Navy organizations, one of them being the Commanders Club of Michigan, and I'll get into that in a little bit and how that relates to all of this. Um, been a history buff all my life, experienced a lot of history. Of course, our family here had the funeral home in Battle Creek for uh, 106 years before we sold, so we've been close to a lot of Battle Creek history in a lot of ways. And uh, including the one, what's that? The, including the current one. Yep. That's going on. Yep. Yeah, Kellogg here too. We were we were here actually three. Well, we bought it just after Kellogg came to town and started up. So mm -hmm. a little bit about Navy history and more specifically the history of Michigan. Um, when I talk, I always like to talk about this book a little bit. Um, Michigan history is a, Michigan is a great state for history. Uh, so much has happened here. Uh, we probably, it's said that Battle Creek has the best history in the state of Michigan. I think that's correct. Uh, but Michigan probably has the best history of any other state in the Union. Uh, so many things have happened here uh, militarily, politically, culturally, economically. Uh, it's just, it's fascinating to study it. Um, but one of my favorite books, if you're interested in history, is uh, this book. In 1976, during the centennial, they asked each state to put together a state history. And they asked prominent authors to, in that state to do that history. And they selected Bruce Catton, I don't know if you remember Bruce Catton, who was the Pulitzer Prize winning Civil War author. He's from Benzonia, Michigan. He's written mm -hmm. books about Michigan. Uh, and he had a whole series of books on the Civil War, which won the Pulitzer Prize, and all that. And so he was like to be the historian. Each each state did a history book for the centennial, and his is it's really easy reading. It's, it's just a great thing. But I just want to talk. I, I love his prose and the way he opens up and talks about Michigan. I just like to. I always like to read this to you. And it says that Michigan has never really had a present moment. It has a mysterious past and an incalculable future attractive and terrifying by turns, but the moment where the two meet is always the time of transition. The state is caught between yesterday and tomorrow, existing less for itself than for what it leads to. It is a road whose ends are distorted by imagination and imperfect knowledge. The great American feeling of being en route to the unknown, to something new, to the fantastic reality that must lie beyond the mist is perfectly represented here. If the nation is now wholly given over to the making and using of highways, here maybe is where the process began. And it's interesting to note, it's probably characteristic that the first white men who saw Michigan looked past it in the belief they were entering China, <laughs> with Marco Polo and Kupla Khan haunting the land just beyond Lake Michigan. And this is one of my favorite little stories. Jean Nicolet, the Frenchman, Catton didn't like the French. He, throughout his books, he kind of like really disses the French. But he did point out that Jean Nicolet, the Frenchman, who cruised the Straits of Mackinac uh, from Lake Huron and donned Mandarin robes when he went ashore in Green Bay, thinking that he had made it to the Orient, and presented gifts to the Menominee Indians. <laughs> so it's just one of those little faux pas in history that was kind of interesting and the belief that the freshwater sea had led him to the Orient. But he was the first in a long procession. So he didn't find what he expected to find, but at least he learned the world is bigger, and a bigger, great bigger deal than he thought it was. So with that, a um, little bit about Michigan. Uh, Michigan, said from the early explorers on, is surrounded by four of the five Great Lakes. Uh, we are, for all intent and purposes, a maritime state. A lot of people seem to forget that. We get wrapped up in the, uh, the military here, or the Army, the Air Force, and all that. We've had Fort Custer here, but we often forget that we have a long, strong maritime history in the state. So I want to start off a little bit. I, the program I have here is a brief that we did with, I'm a member of the Commander's Club, and I'll explain that a little bit, but the Commander's Club is a descendant of the Michigan Naval Militia. And we had a tough time about continuing the word militia. It's a bad connotation it has right. now. But uh, when the state was first forming, uh, we had both land and naval forces. We had a land militia and a naval militia. And 
going back, just a little history here, going back to Mackinac uh, during the War of 1812, of course, you know, the, uh, the British captured the fort, took it from us. In the War of 1812, we had the decisive battle in Lake Erie, and we sailed up through Lake Huron and with the goal of taking back Fort Mackinac, this young American Navy. Uh, we, went, we destroyed Fort St. Joseph, which is now in Canada, it's on the other side of the St. Mary's River. And we went to take back Fort Mackinac. And our the ships we had at the time came in the harbor there in Mackinac, and we started firing. Unfortunately, our cannons at the time couldn't train high enough to hit the fort, and we basically bombarded Marquette Park, which is there now. And uh, at that time, the, the British came charging down the hill, and they also were allied with uh, several bands of, uh, of Indians and Native Americans who were their allies in that, and all of a sudden this throng of people came running down. The Americans retreated to Round Island and uh, scratched their heads and said, well, I guess we're not taking the fort back. So uh, they sailed back to Fort Pontchartrain in Detroit, uh, unsuccessfully taking back Fort Mackinac. Uh, a few years later, War of 1812 ended, and in about 1816, uh, when the treaties were signed, um, the British felt they no longer needed the fort. Uh, the world was changing, we expanded, and they returned to the United States. And what's an interesting tidbit of history is that Mackinac Island was the very last place in the United States the British flag came down uh, when they turned the flag back. Uh, to the United States and gave us back the fort. So it's a little tidbit of history. It's kind of <laughs> interesting. Um, as we were a growing state, uh, there was a need for naval militia. Uh, the U.S. was, uh, the Navy really wasn't very strong yet. We had, uh, uh, the Navy lacks a lot of the resources if we had armed conflicts and they established state militias in, in maritime states. Think of a maritime state, you think of New York, New Jersey, uh, along the East Coast, um, and certainly, of course, Michigan. So, all these states had organized or semi organized naval militias that were made up of basically volunteers. Uh, and basically, the uh, fear at the time was invasion from the British from Canada. We still weren't sure if the British were going to mass in Canada and come back down through the Great Lakes. And, try and take back the, the old Northwest Territory. Uh, so we made provision for it, um, did all that. And it's kind of interesting here, the enrollment classification through the state legislature in May of 1893, uh, the classification and the qualifications were all seafaring men engaged in navigation of lakes, rivers, and waters of the state. Any person engaged in the construction or management of ships all ship owners and their employees, all yacht owners, and all members of yacht clubs and those involved in aquatic sports, and any ex-officers or former enlisted U.S. Navy men. So qualifications to join the Navy militia really weren't real high. Uh, um, and we had at that time a naval force that was separate from the land force, uh, that could, but the Navy forces could be attached to the Michigan National Guard if we needed it, which became the National Guard. So anyways, the, the land militia that we had came the Michigan National Guard. Uh, the Navy militia went on to become the Navy Reserve. So, Spanish-American War, 1898, uh, Roosevelt. Um, at the time, the Navy had a sh real shortage of officers and men and needed to activate the militias. So we had the militias from all these states who volunteered for service and went down to the Caribbean and uh, manned some of the ships down there. And uh, it wasn't, let's say, real organized at the time. Uh, at that time, Theodore Roosevelt was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and he fully supported the use of these militias. He figured they were sufficient enough to participate in the war. He chose five uh, he chose five of them for deep sea patrol vessels, uh, which were from the best reports from the regular officers during the past year. Uh, there are five thoroughly efficient organizations. So he, he said, well, look, that up. They're, they're good enough, so we're going to bring in the, the naval militias from the state to support us in this war. Um, 
And what the Michigan Naval Militia at the time was assigned to a ship called the USS Yosemite. His auxiliary crews are under the command of William Emery. And it was crewed by an entirely Michigan Naval Militia crew. And they went to Jamaica to capture what's called the Parisma Concepcion, but they completely missed the steamer when it passed at night. And the commander had to reprimand his men to the rig for a good portion of the crew were drunk and absent from duty. Uh, and they had a port call in St. Thomas and they completely missed their mission because too many people got drunk. So it was uh, not a good scene, so they had to redeem themselves. And then uh, they are involved in the Third Battle of San Juan. Uh, they engaged a squadron of Spanish ships, a cruiser and two gunboats. Uh, they captured the SS Antonio Lopez, a oceanic steamer carrying supplies, and then uh, allowed them to unfold the ship and ran the ship aground. And they, uh, they were relieved by the USS New Orleans, and uh, which ended up destroying the ship that they stopped, captured, and uh, so that was about the height of the Michigan militia and Spanish-American War. It wasn't real spectacular, it wasn't real uh, laudatory, but uh, we did a little something. So. And this is the USS Yosemite, which was, uh, at the time, it was, it was just converted steamships. Uh, uh, they brought guns on board and they did what they could with it. And, uh, but it was more for patrol, um, intelligence, and uh, blockade duties. So it really wasn't, as you'd say, a warship at the time, but it was more of a, uh, a blockade ship in a lot of ways. So. Well, Roosevelt, after the Spanish-American War, uh, who's known as the father of the modern Navy, saw the need to really have a strong Navy uh, after he became both Secretary of the Navy and then he became President. And he created, you know, the great white fleet that sailed around the world to show our, our presence. And this is when the Navy really started growing, really started, really became of age. Uh, from that time, Britain was the world's greatest Navy, uh, who, you know, they said the sun never set on the British Empire because they were all over the world and the greatest seafaring nation at the time. Uh, but as America was becoming in the 20th century, Roosevelt made sure that we became the greatest seafaring nation of all time and created the, the Great White Fleet and the uh, show of force around the world, which was, uh, kind of set the ball in motion for um, the modern Navy. Well, at that time, since we're building a Navy, we needed a Navy Reserve. Uh, uh, we needed a qualified and organized and we had the state militias and all, all that, but they really weren't that well qualified, a little disorganized. So in 1915, just before the uh, start of World War I, we'd established a Navy Reserve of a corps of uh, sailors and men that we could call upon to, uh, to augment the, the Navy in times of war. Um, so it was born in 1915, and basically, the, in Michigan at least, the the naval militia was rolled into the Navy Reserve, uh, much like the, the land militia became the National Guard. So we have the National Guard now and the Navy Reserve. Uh, the Navy was federalized, the Guard remained a state-sponsored uh, uh, organization. So that got rolling in 1915. I'll show you back here. Um, that time, Edwin Denby, I probably recognize that name from Detroit, Denby High School in Detroit. Denby was a University of Michigan graduate and a star football player at Michigan uh, in 18, what was it, 1896. Uh, football was just starting to take off. And he had served in the Marine Corps after graduating from Michigan and then served in politics and all that and was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy and then eventually became Secretary of the Navy. And he was either Assistant Secretary or Secretary at the time the Navy Reserve was established. And uh, we believe this is a photo of him federalizing the Navy militia here. That's somewhere in Detroit, I'm not really sure where, but um, it's around 1915 when the Navy Reserve was first established. And uh, they basically registered the entire the Navy militia into the Navy Reserve and federalized it. And so we now had a federal force. Like that. And uh, this is just one of the scenes from that, and that's the, the, the naval 
militia flag that's, that was in the beginning of the slides. That was a, like that's probably on Woodward in Detroit. We I don't not sure exactly where that is, um, but Detroit where the Naval Armory was there, the Broadhead Naval Armory was on the Detroit River, uh, probably somewhere near there. Uh, but that's uh, one of the few pictures remaining of the Michigan Naval Militia. When it was, uh, uh, well, now that they're Navy Reservist, World War II came along, and what do we do with the Navy Reserve? And uh, Michigan uh, played a significant role in the Navy Reserve. Uh, two of the officers who were formerly in the Navy militia in Michigan became officers in the Navy Reserve. Uh, these two, Hayden and Rogers, and they went on to uh, man, you know, we talk about experimental warfare, um, with drones today and all that. Well, in those days, this was their experimental warfare, a naval railway gun. And what they did is um, they took old ships, they took the guns off them, and they mounted them on a, on a rail car and uh, took them to the battlefield. Major problem with them. One, the weight destroyed the tracks. <laughs> you can only fire them in the direction of the track. And when you did fire them, it rolled back about 40 feet. <laughs> so uh, it was not a real success. It was a, it was a great idea, but it never really took off. But uh, the railway guns in World War I were a big part of the Navy Reserve and what the Navy Reserve did, which is kind of interesting. So, and they also had a uh, Navy Reserve or Navy Militia training ship before that. Here, it was actually in Detroit, about 1907 and 1917, and then uh, it was one of the captured ships during the Spanish-American War that we had here, and then it was returned to the Navy and recommissioned as the Navy ship. So it actually started as a Spanish ship, captured, became a Naval Militia ship, and then was returned to the Navy and became a Navy ship, so there's been a lot of, <coughs> before we had started really building ships, we were you know, capturing ships, refitting them, and making them, making them our own. Um, one of the remnants of the militia was the need for training uh, of these officers, and uh, now that they're now in the Navy Reserve, so what was created, and actually one of the very first uh, Reserve Officer Training Corps, ROTC, was established at the University of Michigan in 1916. And under that they had a, uh, the first class was inducted by that time Governor Sleeper and the Navy had a DEC, a Line Engineering and Aeronautics Division. And they also took in their first few years 170 men that were trained, uh, including 14 students from Ann Arbor High School. And then it, uh, eventually rolled into the uh, part of the Navy ROTC system at other major colleges, but we, Michigan was one of the first, and the brigade is still is strong at Michigan, and the brigade at Michigan also includes students of Eastern Michigan, so mm -hmm. to join the ROTC battalion at Michigan, you can be either a Michigan student or an Eastern Michigan student and be part of that, so they rolled them all together. And that's one of the premier, um, one of the first ROTC units in Michigan, or in the nation actually. So, This is interesting too, uh, World War II, there was actually a transport ship that was made, named for Joseph T. Dickman. Um, you know, uh, General Dickman was the first commanding officer of Fort Custer, uh, was a West Point graduate, and uh, the ship actually had saw service on D-Day, uh, landed at Utah Beach, and returned for the wounded the next day uh, to England, and then resupplied a week later. So kind of a connection to Michigan is uh, the Dickman who was, uh, it went on and uh, just became a transport ship after that, but it did see quite a bit of activity along with a lot of other ships. On. I get into the, uh, like I mentioned the Commander's Club of Michigan, which I'm a member of and which I'm, uh, it's an honorary organization uh, supporting the maritime service, but the history behind it we had our 50th anniversary, it was formed in 1962. Um, it was founded as an honorary organization by Governor Swainson. And early in the 60s, Governor Swainson was brought to his attention that, he, and by the way, Governor Swainson was a combat wounded veteran and recovered a Percy Jones here along with Hartville, one in a way, 
So he was actually there, and then he became governor. It's kind of people forget those big names, but he, he ended up going into politics too, becoming governor. But they found that there was still a codicil in the Michigan Constitution authorizing a naval militia that had never been taken off the books. Uh, back in the beginning of the century, when it was rolled in the Navy Reserve, and the, the militia never existed anymore, uh, they brought up to him and said, do we want to do something to take this off the books, or what do we want to do? Because <coughs> under the Michigan Constitution, we still authorized a naval militia in Michigan. And, uh, he thought about it, and the solution was to make it an honorary maritime organization. And what they did is they took people, business people, anybody that had a uh, interest in that, didn't necessarily have to be veterans, most of them, members are veterans who've done this, and they were to become ambassadors for maritime interest in the state of Michigan. And there's actually, um, so we get a commission when we join the Commanders Club, we're actually commissioned by the Adjutant General and the governor, and we are actually a branch of the <coughs> Michigan Department of Military and Government Affairs. Uh, they still have never figured out what to do with this, you know, and we've offered, you know, let us be you know, ambassadors, we can do this, and we can uh, go out and do good things to talk about maritime in Michigan, what, uh, and uh, Michigan, when you think of the military in Michigan, the Navy usually doesn't come to mind. <laughs> And as when I drilled here, and he'll, he'll tell you too, that it's seeing town in uniform, and it's always, oh, you're in the Guard? You know, I'm in the Navy. <laughs> the Navy, there's no Navy, there's no ships here. And I said, well, you know, 80% of the jobs in the Navy, you're land-based, so. Uh, but anyways, so that was always the challenge. So we're, so the Commander's Club is a maritime support organization. Uh, Militarily, now they kind of change a couple years ago, we're considered now the Michigan Naval Brigade, which is a group under the Adjutant General of Michigan. So we do, we do have a small place in the structure of the Michigan military today, but we're still trying to flex our muscle a little bit and do some things. And we've got to remind them we're still here sometimes. <laughs> uh, some of the things that the Commanders Club have done, when we first started in 62, we helped establish the Maritime Academy, which is now in Traverse City. The Great Lakes Maritime Academy is one of six uh, maritime academies around the state training mariners, the only one in the Great Lakes, and probably one of the best uh, by all accounts. Uh, maritime Academy is growing, and it's, it's at the Haggerty Center now. Uh, you'll see it right there in Traverse City as you come in. And they also have a training ship called the State of Michigan. Uh, the graduates of that program, they have a dual degree program with Ferris, and when a cadet graduates from the Maritime Academy, they also have gotten a business degree from Ferris, and they go into the fleet, and the maritime industry is one of the few uh, third-class mariners that have college degrees, and especially business degrees, because the way to move up in the maritime world is to have a degree and to, and to know the business. Um, a graduate of the Maritime Academy today can probably pull down anywhere from seventy-five dollars to $100,000 a year uh, with their third class license. Uh, the need is really great out there right now. And what a lot of the Great Lakes Mariners do is they'll spend the season on the Great Lakes then they'll go to the, the salties and go south and uh, be on an ocean going ship. So they can literally work all year, they can work all season. So uh, but the Great Lakes Maritime Academy has produced some of the top uh, mariners in the state and probably in the world. Um, I said Michigan is a shipping, has a huge shipping industry we often forget about. Some of you have probably seen the freighters go through the uh, Sioux Locks or the Detroit River, uh, but when you stop and look at the Great Lakes, I mean, everywhere from Duluth all the way down, and for years with all the steel industries down in the Pennsylvania and Ohio, uh, with ore coming out of there, we've had just a world, I mean, between Chicago, we've got Chicago, Milwaukee, Duluth, Detroit, and then all off the St. Lawrence Seaway to the ocean, so um, we are, uh, we often forget how much this state relies on the maritime industry out of the tune of about $35 billion a year uh, in shipping. And it employs probably about 240,000 people uh, in the Great Lakes. 
Uh, it's huge. Um, but a lot of times, you know, we often forget about it until we see a ship out on Lake Michigan, you know. And, uh, uh, at any given time, there are 25 to 50 freighters somewhere on the Great Lakes, uh, moving cargo, moving ore, moving uh, things around, even going to the ocean and going to all points in the world. So we really are a world port in Detroit, Chicago, Milwaukee, uh, Duluth. Um, it's amazing when you stop and think about it. So the other things we've been involved in, the Commander's Club, we took part in ship commissionings. Um, and we especially got involved with two of the aircraft carriers. A lot of us uh, went and took part in the commissioning of the George H.W. Bush. Uh, George Bush's connection, he trained uh, to be a naval aviator uh, on Lake Michigan. And back when the day when they had Navy Pier on there, we actually had two carriers or ships with steamships that had a deck built on them at Navy Pier. And he flew out of Glenview, Illinois, and did his carrier training on Lake Michigan. So he had a, there was a connection of George Bush to Michigan, and that's uh, what's interesting. The ship's logo here, the ship's seal, it has the plane he flew when he was shot down. Um, the next plane was the F-14 inside that, and then outside is the F-18. So those are all the planes that were in the inventory that he flew. That were, oh, the transition from the F-14 to the F-18 are all represented in that logo right there. And then the newest ship we have right now is the Gerald R. Ford. And of course, Gerald Ford from Michigan, 38th president, was also a naval officer. Um, he, uh, this is the fact that he has an entire class of ship named after him. This is uh, up through George H.W. Bush, was a Nimitz class carrier. Uh, pretty much similar all the way back to the Nimitz, the Eisenhower, and up through that. There's eight of them that were built as Nimitz class carriers. The Gerald Ford class carrier is the newest class of carrier to uh, completely modern. The bridge is farther back, a whole different flight deck configuration. But one of the key things about this is that years ago they had steam-powered catapults to launch aircraft. The Ford has uh, magnetic uh, catapults. In other words, it's, uh, there's no steam, it's all magnetically driven that drives it. That's presented a lot of problems at first, we're still getting used to it, but the, uh, the thing about a carrier is that when you're doing flight ops, they have distillers, they have two 200,000 gallon water distillers on it, and the steam from the catapult eats up about two-thirds of the water they can make in a day. Uh, you also got to have water for habitability, for sanitation, and all that. So, so you don't have as much need to make steam on the new catapults. It's kind of neat. One other cool thing about the uh, Gerald Ford and its ship's logo. Um, of course, the, the theme for this is integrity at the helm. Uh, you know, he took over as president at the end of Watergate when Nixon resigned. So, the fitting theme for the ship is integrity at the helm. Uh, but what's kind of neat is that Gerald Ford was a big Boy Scout. And in the up here is the Boy Scout Fleur de Lis is at the north point of his ship's seal, which was put in there, which is kind of neat. And of course, the signature and the compass rose and all that. So that is just a, a lot of thought goes into the ship's seals when you do that. Uh, we also took part in uh, ship commissionings. Some of us, where I know Lou was over there with us from the USS Freedom was commissioned in Milwaukee. Uh, the littoral combat ships, these are the these are the first warships that were built on the Great Lakes. They're built in Marionette, Wisconsin, uh, which is right on the uh, uh, Menominee River, right across from Menominee. And 80% of the workforce that builds these are Michiganders, Newpers. Um, so this is launched in Lake Michigan. We were there for the uh, Commission of the Freedom. And uh, the seventh one commissioned was the Detroit, uh, which was actually commissioned at, um, right in front of the Renaissance Center. Uh, in Detroit, one of the few ships that actually was commissioned in its namesake city, which was kind of neat to do. One of the things we're involved in is the Sea Cadet Program. Uh, the Sea Cadets are sponsored by the Navy League of the United States, which uh, we also have a relationship with. Uh, the Commander's Club has two, but probably 80 to 90 percent of the recruits in the Navy come from the heartland, come from here, they come from Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Chicago. Um, so we've done a lot of help with uh, recruiters and helping 
whatever they need to do. We've done a lot of work with recruiters. Um, and this just gives you an idea. We have Navy Recruiting District Michigan, which includes both Michigan and Indiana. Uh, there's 32 recruiting stations uh, headquartered in Detroit, uh, all around the state. It's kind of hard to see here, but uh, all over um, Michigan and then into Indiana, too. We have a, some mostly in northern Indiana. Uh, so both Michigan and Indiana, and it's, it's a hotbed of recruiting. And we've, uh, it's a very successful area for recruiting uh, to the Navy. The Navy Reserve today, um, this just gives you an idea of what the Reserve Force is today. In the United States, uh, in the continental United States is divided up into regions, and we're in the Great Lakes or Mid-Atlantic region, which involves all these states. Uh, our Reserve Center here in Battle Creek um, with the headquarters at Great Lakes, Illinois, right down here. Um, and then includes all these other reserve centers all around in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, even into Virginia and North Carolina. And these, it, talk about gerrymandering, it changes every few years and it's probably, some of these states probably went to the south instead of us. Um, up until 2005, we also had a couple of uh, reserve centers in the Upper Peninsula. We had one at Marquette and actually one in Duluth and those were lost in the 2005 BRAC. If you remember that it saved the Battle Creek Airport, mm -hmm. part of what was eliminated in that were those two reserve centers. So, so anybody that lives in the UP now, that's the Navy Reserve as Hansen goes all the way to Green Bay to drill, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of defeats the purpose of having reserve centers because you want to have them close to home so they don't have to travel far to train and do that. But we always said that, you know, that um, from pulling out of Duluth and Marquette that uh, Lake Superior is now wide open to Canadian aggression. <laughs> so that's all. Oh well. <laughs> um, and this is our, our Navy Operational Support Center. The Navy likes to change the name of things a lot. It used to be a Navy Reserve Center. We were there as a Reserve Center, the Res Center. Um, they went to a concept where they were more closely related to the Navy provide more direct support to the Navy, so they changed all the reserve centers to a Navy Operational Support Center, or a NOSC. Um, and this is what was built out in Fort Custer, right here. This is, uh, if you see it, it's right, Denso Road is right over here, and Denso would be here. Yeah. But anyways, it's uh, right across the street from Denso. And uh, after 9-11, they moved it from where we used to be in Springfield, and our old reserve center is now the, the Marine Corps Reserve Center. When Lou and I drilled out there, um, it was called the Navy and Marine Corps Reserve Center. And Marines drilled one weekend and we drilled another one. But now the Marines totally own the old Navy Reserve Center, and we have a new one here. And in 2012, they consolidated the reserve centers in Grand Rapids and Lansing. So we, this, our reserve center grew to the point where we have two drill weekends a month. The problem with it out there is it's on Fort Custer, it's secure, and it's really hard to get into. I mean, you've got to make arrangements just to go out and visit or to go there, even as retirees out there. I mean, we used to just stop in and, you know, check on things, see how things are going, and you got to have a act of Congress now to get on base and get in there and, and do that. But, um, but it is a great facility, and we, we're really kind of proud of it here. We uh, had a few events out there, um, so we do have a a large Navy presence here in Battle Creek on weekends, um, doing two weekends a month actually, because we have so many now from the other two reserve centers that are combined here, so it's good. And then we've had an effort to get a ship named for Battle Creek for the last 12, 15 years after we went to the uh, Freedom Commissioning. And I did some research. So far, this is the only ship that's ever been named for Battle Creek, <laughs> and it's a Prometheus class starship. So. That's it. So we, we don't have a ship name yet, but apparently we will in the future. So um, that's it. That's the new USS Battle Creek. So uh, that's an ongoing effort. Problem with getting a ship name is very political. Um, we've had not real good leadership from our members of Congress in the last few years. And uh, so it's just, it takes a whole congressional delegation to get behind it and go for it and to beat on the door. What's interesting is that to name a ship, by tradition, the Secretary of Navy is the sole decider. Um, people can recommend things to him, people can 
Congress usually sets up like the class of ship that these LCSs that they're building were to be named for small to mid-sized American cities. And some of them were, but you know, Detroit, Minneapolis, uh, St. Louis, I mean, I mean, are hardly small to mid-sized cities. Um, but they did get the Cooperstown, they got uh, Beloit, got one, um, a few other small, and, but we just didn't have the political muscle to really do it. But it, it may happen someday. We'll keep pushing for that. So, and other than that, um, anybody has any questions about anything? Um, Got to make a blatant plug for my book here. If you'd like to buy one of my books here, I'll sign them. Uh, half the proceeds will go to the museum. I'd also like to make a pitch too for how many of your museum members here. Okay, we got a we got a good market here. So <laughs> I'll get you a brochure. We, we're we're trying to get membership here. As you said, we're back out here. We uh, we're a work in progress, and this is going to be a world class museum eventually. Um, like I said, Michigan and Battle Creek have some of the best history in the state, and this is going to be a focal point going forward. And whatever you can do to help, I mean, we get grants, we get you know that. But it takes it takes the community to get in to join to be members, and uh, if you can do it, uh, become a member, um, do what you can. Uh, we also have one. We start something that's kind of unique called the 1850 Club. And if you, and it's really pretty easy. 1850 was the year Battle Creek was chartered and became an actual city. And uh, you can go online, set it up, and it'll take out of your account 1850 a month. So you can pay, or you can pay 223, is it, or two, every, you know, once a year if you want. But, uh, but it's an easy way to make a payment and be part of that club. The 1850 club, we're going to have some special events for, um, we do some gatherings here and have some special people come in or some VIP receptions. So, so there's some benefits to doing that too. So, anything else you want to add to that? No, that's great. I mean, also, you know, we have the, the newsletter, so certainly sign up with your email. Good. On the, on the sign up form. And I got to make another pitch too here. I don't know if anybody saw this. Michigan History Magazine, which is published by the Historical Society of Michigan, uh, the May, March. Uh, March, April edition that came out, both. Kathy and I, by coincidence, have stories published in this magazine. She did one on Mary Coleman, and I, I did one on Homer Strikers. So we got them out here for sale if you want to buy one of them. And it's also a just an unbelievable story about Michigan and the Vietnam War. There's a lot of stuff I didn't know. Um, they put together a big uh, section here about you know Dow Chemical, how it was involved in the war, and how uh, Michigan battalions and Michigan uh, regiments, you know, fared in the war. It was just, there's a lot of really, Michigan, you know, had a lot of interaction in Vietnam, so, and um, speaking of that too, in July, the wall is coming, to, if you haven't heard about it yet, the wall is coming to Battle Creek. Uh, it's going to be here for three days, they're trying to go out and see the wall, the hills, uh, the, we're one of the only states, we're the only cities in Michigan that got it this year. Harper Creek. It's at Harper Creek High School. 14th to the 17th of July, so do that. So, got any questions, anything, or any comments? So, yeah. Very good presentation. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Very good. So, who, who's already on the list? So. <laughs>